Hello, Benjamin. Can you sound all right? You sound all right. Can I sound all right? You sound wonderful. Let me just type myself so I don't get distracted. How's your morning? I love the way you had to pause. Yeah, the morning's wonderful. My son and husband are still in bed, so I'm an early riser. I'm up by five o'clock. Okay. Do you have a garden that you tend first thing? No, we live in a 14th floor apartment in the city, so. Okay. So you just have like a cockatoo then? Not even a cockatoo. <laughs> oh, no. I guess just a Just a husband of 48 years and a 47-year-old son. Oh, okay. Uh, the math works out then. Yeah. And uh, what... I want to hear your history. I want, I want to hear your life story and how you got into sexology. But Oh, that's a long story, Benjamin. I'll give you the quickie version. Don't be too I quick. Was, I have a whole hour with you, so take your time. I was born in Sri Lanka, in the tea plantations of Sri Lanka. This was in 1947, so it was the kind of closing years of the colonial era because Sri Lanka got independence, sort of tagged on to India. So the tea plantations were run by the British. And so my father, being a native, couldn't go any higher than looking after the tea factory. So that was as high as the natives could go. And then there were the Indian indentured la uh, laborers who worked in the tea plantation. So that's how I grew up. And then I went to a Methodist missionary school and to medical school in Sri Lanka. And at that time, we had very few women who were academics. So we, And then I went on a scholarship to Hawaii. And that's where I got into sex. Well, I must have known something because my son was two years, three years old. But um, my professor, you might have come across his name, was Professor Milton Diamond. He's still alive, but he's quite unwell. Mil Mickey, as we called him, Milton Diamond, was uh, during his PhD time, he challenged John Money on that John Joan case. You probably come across that one with John Money where, so he challenged him on that case. So he was quite well known at the time I was with him, which was 1980. And this was in Hawaii at the University of Honolulu, Manoa in Hawaii. And he was actually at that time running transsexual clinics. As you know, they were called transsexual. So it was fascinating. I was like in my 30s and this really conservative Christian Tamil woman who brought up and I was helping him in the transsexual clinics in 1980. Fascinating because they were only males we would see, adult males, as you know, at that time. And I would take histories and now I realized that I was talking to people with autogynophilia, but I didn't know at that time. And I don't think Mickey had a name for that either. So it was fascinating. And we would have like parties at his place where we would have all these transsexuals. And so it was fascinating time. And so I did my master's with him. Could, could, we, back, could sure. we pause for a moment? Because there's a lot right there. Um, could we get into the John Money case? Because that name sure. comes up and I have not done due diligence on my channel to discuss John Money. Sure. So can you talk about him a bit and then um, Milton well, Diamond's I, challenge? I didn't actually do a lot of work either on John Money or with him. But everything I knew was working with Mickey Milton, Mickey Diamond. And what I was really aware at from what he told me and reading the book that John Calapinto's book on the history of the case was just the background that there were these children, twins, where one of them had accidental 
removal of the penis during circumcision. And so that one was brought up as a girl, the Joan and the boy, but come adolescence, the quote unquote, the one who was transitioned, or they didn't call it at that time, to a girl was very confused and then went back to living as a boy, but ultimately committed suicide. And that really traumatized Mickey Milton Diamond because he was supporting, I think, supporting that boy during that time. So it was really sad because what Mickey was going back on that fact that you cannot just transition a child and accept the child, expect the child to accept it. But there was a biological something that would then bring him back to who he was. And so that was his take. And that's as much as I knew as a master's student. Mm, mm. Uh, this is totally off topic. Um, maybe not. There's this brand new movement called intactivism. And it's kind of a men's rights movement uh, against circumcision. Uh, so do you have any thoughts on circumcision and uh, the history of it and uh, the medical side and the ethical side of that being a Christian well, being a sexologist well all I know is that the circumcision was like biblically it was something that Abraham who both Islam and Christianity look at as the forefather that when Abraham was given a cup now I have to get away from using Christian terms. When God gave him a promise, we call it a covenant. When God gave him that covenant, the circumcision or the removal of the prepuce of the penis was a sign between God and Abraham. And so therefore, Islam and Jewish races would keep that sign of circumcision. However, we who are Christians believe that after Jesus came, that kind of ritual circumcision was sort of superseded by Jesus coming for us. And therefore, Christians don't have the covenant or the promise or the need for circumcision. So that's the history hmm. of circumcision. When medically... I mean, I'm often asked when I work as a sexologist in Sri Lanka because we have Islamic people and Buddhists and Hindus and Christians. Christians, tiny minority, mainly Buddhist and the race of Sinhalese and then Hindus and small number of Christians and small number of uh, Muslims. But I would be asked about circumcision too. One, is it necessary for health? And two, does it affect our sexual feelings? And we would discuss one about, it's not necessary for health if you actually take care in cleaning and bathing yourself. But for some people, if there's a tight, a tight prepuce, then you might have to need surgery to just loosen it, not necessarily have a circumcision. And when it comes to sensation, because the prepuce, the prepuce covers the glands of the penis. Am I getting too technical here? No, no? please do. The We're glands good. of the penis and the glands is like really, really, really sensitive that when you remove the skin, that covering the epithelium or the covering can get thicker. And so some people report a slight decrease in sensation, but not everyone. Because look, as we tell people as sexologists, we've got a whole body that is erotic. Why do people have like every arrow pointing to your genitals? You know, like <laughs> as Christians, we have a book called 1 Corinthians. And in 1 chapter 7, it says, husband, your whole body belongs to your husband, wife. And wife, your whole body belongs to the husband. So I tell people, you've got erotic zones all over your body. Don't concentrate on the penis and much less on your glands. Yeah. And so ethically, have you dealt with female genital mutilation? Um, and that term is really different than circumcision, which can be uh, thought of as male genital mutilation. What, what, what are your thoughts? What are the differences between those two practices and the ethics around them? 
Well, I have only discussed with a few people in Sri Lanka because it was not a practice among the Islamic community in Sri Lanka. So it was only when I was in Hawaii and I would meet some who came more from the African countries. Like I had this colleague who was for a short time there from Djibouti and these sort of African countries where they would practice it. And we would have these discussions. Well, Looking at it both practically, medically, as a sexologist and as a woman, basically removal of any part of the genitals in a woman, especially the, the female genital, what they would call castration, which is mutilation, which is really removal of the clitoris and all the tissue associated with it, which is a primary pleasure sensory organ. And of course, when it goes to the other stages, they would really suture up the vaginal opening. So they would leave only a tiny opening. And that uh, the ones the African men I have talked to would say that that would mean that during first intercourse, it would be really traumatic and tear open that. So it's basically it's mutilation. We might as well use the word for it. And that makes it very different. The circumcision, which is a religious practice, and although it's and done for a baby, probably something the child doesn't remember even later on. So I would say they're distinctly different. Mm -hmm. uh, the loss of function, aside from medical malpractice of circumcision, is negligible. Whereas, in my opinion, and from my talking to Islamic men who have had it, I would say yes. Hmm. So you said that Sri Lanka has a very small Christian population. How did you um, get uh, Christianized? What drew you to the church? Oh, my parents were converted. My father's father, my grandfather was converted by a Methodist missionary. And so actually we had a name change. My grandfather's name was Rasa Yamutu Elu Ratnam. Don't even try to say that. But when he was converted, it was convert changed to Roberts. So I grew up as Patricia Roberts. So that was a kind of thing there that you changed it to a British name when you were converted. So what happened was I wasn't really a Christian. I grew up like just grew up as it. But when I went to school we had a wonderful methodist missionary and i often think you know we think of colonialism as really bad but many of us who grew up in the colonies have a lot of good history like this woman really taught me to love god and that's how i became a christian and it's been just wonderful since then how much i've been able to grow and as a sexologist people think it's really weird but hey I well, it. It, it, it is an odd pairing. So what was it about sex uh, then? Uh, or And were you always clinically minded? Were you kind of just, you had a doctor mind or researcher mind? That fascinating question, because in Sri Lanka, if women were pretty much given a good status, because you see, Buddhism is a religion which kind of really looks at equality of sexes. And so the cultural versus the Buddhist religion, we, we had the first woman prime minister in probably in the world. We had a woman prime minister when I was in my teens. So the reality is that being a Christian, I guess the best way I can say is an re response I gave to a professor in US when I was on study leave, who asked me just this, Christian and sexologist, how? And I said, I said, look, you and I study sex and we research it. But you know what to me was most exciting that I would study it and research it. And then I would read the word of God and I would kind of think, this is who created sex. So as a Christian, it was exciting for me to see how the research and God's word had wonderful enmeshing. And that's why I love to speak to children and schools and parents and churches, because we need to be enlightened to the wonderful sexual, healthy sexuality in terms of how God portrays it. 
Mm. There is in America a lot of, well, it's always been going on. Sex has always been kind of contentious for us because we, um, I, I think part of part of our culture is just descendant from the Puritans. So it's just kind of baked in there where we just have this odd attitude. And so it's always very contentious. And within the United States education over the last several decades, or at least ramping up within the last decade, sex um, education has been infected by what we call gender ideology or these ideas of gender and these ideas of activism and these uh, open celebration of kink and other forms of alternative pleasures and paraphilias and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So going back to your foundation of what you teach, what, from your point of view, what is a good sex education that's ethical, moral, and proper to public education? In public education, let, let me preface that by saying that I speak in a Christian context. So I am invited to speak to churches, youth groups, and Christian schools because they know that I'm unashamedly Bible-based in how I speak. But let me just put that in a broader context. And in a broader context, it is actually no different to what we would present to Christians without necessarily that Bible basis. So what do I mean? What is healthy sexuality? So we start with looking at what's the body. Now, as Christians, we would say created male, female, equal, but different. And with bodies that are beautifully complementary. So I think sex education has to unashamedly teach about how male and female bodies and brains, you know, when we look at the sexual response, male and female are different. So just teach at an age appropriate manner that there is a bodily difference between male and female, and that's important. Secondly, we would teach very clearly that behavior as male and female there is a variation, male, female. However, there is also sufficient research to say that there is an overlap. So we teach away from stereotypes. And this is something that I strongly teach in the churches, that we have to keep away from this stereotypical male and female behavior. Yes, there is masculinity and femininity. I was a tomboy. I was a terrific tomboy when I was growing up because who would want to be a girl in Sri, Sri Lanka when you, at our time, when my mother was bringing me up to be a good little girl going into an arranged marriage and I was cooking and cleaning while my brothers were out there, you know, doing boy things. But because I studied and got through to medical college, I was allowed to go to medical school. So we have to keep away. So we have to teach children that you can actually behave in the way you choose, be a tomboy or an effeminate boy, and you're still biologically who you are. And that's, I think, important. And then we talk about sexual orientation, and we need to, in today's culture, when there's all this variation of behavior, give our young people a clear understanding of what it means, the sexual orientation, attraction. We have to teach as in an age appropriate manner about desire, the testosterone driven desire in the brain and puberty and how important puberty is. As you are aware, puberty is almost considered like a disease where a pause button can be put on wrong. It's a beautiful part of growing up. And our children need to see the beauty and the glory of puberty. And that desire happens. But as human beings, as we have a sense of self-control and we can control, we are not kind of balls of hormones that, you know, according to our today's individualistic culture, have to have our desires met. Yes, we have desires, but we can control and choose how we respond. So all these aspects need to be taught in an age-appropriate manner. 
But of course, as Christians, we would underpin it with God's word. Mm -hmm. You've said age appropriate several times now. How does one calculate age appropriateness? It's a couple of things. One is obviously the research science based around what's appropriate for what age. And there's sufficient research around that. But for schools and Christians, we've done a group of us, we looked at it and we've written a series of books that also allow age appropriate education. So you'd start with basic body parts and then around the time of puberty, you would start to discuss the bodily changes and then introduce ideas of desire when desire is naturally occurring. Around puberty. Yeah. What we would do is like what we tell parents and schools that even we need to start teaching the correct words and the body parts really early. So I tell parents, you have to do this at preschool, you know, like your son, daughter, correct body parts. And, and you know, like penis and scrotum, not just, I don't know, I don't know what you guys call it, but whether it's a willy or a whatever, use the right words. And your daughter has vagina, vulva, use the right words. And so from an early age, the kids grow up just recognizing that this is normal. We can talk about the body parts, all body parts, especially with our parents. And then at the preschool age, we tell parents now, and Benjamin, we didn't say this a few years ago. Now we tell parents, you have to teach them that their body is good the way it is made. I mean, look, we never wanted to write a book for preschoolers, but now we are being asked to write. So we are in the process of actually writing a picture book for preschoolers. And in this one, we are trying to not try the message we are giving them is like, obviously, as I said, from a Christian point of view, but that you are a girl or a boy, because that's the way you are made, we would say because God made you that way. And nothing changes this, not what you wear or the length of your hair, or how you want to play, or even how you feel about yourself. So we're kind of teaching kids early that they don't have to buy into the ideology and then get into primary school. We reinforce this by teaching them. And sadly, we have to teach them about keeping away from pornography by mm -hmm. primary school. Mm -hmm. And then when they get into kind of 10 to 14, we talk puberty, and emerging desires. And then when they hit around 14, we introduce a hard topic of gender and, you know, the whole disorders of sexual development and the whole gamut of things and pornography and stuff mm -hmm. they are going to meet in the world today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in your research, what was your, um, what did you end up uh, specializing in, in your master's uh, My thesis was based around disorders in sex development in 1980 and uh, sexual development with Mickey, with Milton Diamond. And how has the research changed or developed in the last 40 years around disorders of sexual development? What uh, I'll just say has been called intersex conditions. So that's a misnomer at this time, but just so yeah, people know. Yeah, or differences. I yeah. still go with disorders because that's what they are. Look, I really don't think we've changed at any of the basic tenets of understanding male, female, clearly binary and disorders. We've looked more into the genetics and, you know, I love reading Colin Wright's work on, you know, all his his work on that but there's clearly male and female and you know all these 0.02 percent of disorders that range of ambiguous genitalia so basically the the facts remain the same because it's the body and what we've got more information and more research is looking at the genetics and the underlying causation and that level of, you know, complexity, I believe, is how it's been changed. Mm -hmm. There is one of the most extreme uh, DSDs is called CASE, or uh, Complete Androgen Insensity Syndrome. 
and I, I've spoke, spoken with Carol Hooven. Uh, she's a Harvard lecturer. She's written about this, and, and I've spoken with somebody who said that they had that. Turned out they didn't, or there's some questions about the legitimacy of that. Um, but it's really interesting because the male, it's a male body, has zero... Um, it can't, uh, I don't know, metabolize is the right word, testosterone at all. So the body takes a female development because the body has to go along a sexed development. I find that really interesting that the, it, it, in order to survive, the body has to initiate some sort of secondary sexual characteristics. Correct. What's going on there? Could you, could you talk a little bit about that? If that's yeah, I'd love your... to because we actually had a client because in uh, a patient, when I went back to Sri Lanka, I was um, lecturing in reproductive physiology at the medical school. And I used to attend the clinics with gynecology friends because I was like this go-to person for like the whole of Sri Lanka if they had any question on sexuality, 20 million population, so you can imagine. And so I had this person, doctor friend consult me and we talked, it was this woman, very attractive woman who had been married and came because she wanted to get pregnant to the gynecology, to the clinic. Now, what the doctor found that all she had was like just a little blind ending vagina. And then, of course, we are talking 19, early 1980s, so no ultrasound, no scans, only x-rays. So they did, uh, and no keyhole surgery. So they did like an exploratory laparotomy because she was didn't give a history of menstruating because you can't menstruate. You have no uterus, just a little ending vagina. And so they then they found that she had undescended testes. And how so did they had, tell, I guess you could probably see the difference between testes and ovaries. Yeah, and of course, you know, you, you can see the difference. I mean, he's an obstetrician. And, they, and then they take it out and do the histology. And you can say on the histology, the cellular structure is distinctly different between sperm producing tissue and ova or egg producing tissue. So she had undescended testes. And I'm saying she, because that's how she saw herself. This woman married and with undescended testes and low testosterone levels. Now, the, of course, at that time we hardly knew. Now I knew because I had studied with Mickey Diamond. So that this was complete androgen insensitivity syndrome. And so the question was, what do you do? Here's this X, Y. So all we could do, they could do the smear of the, the mouth, the oral, you know, you could do a smear and you could just barely do tests to find out XX or XY. So she was XY. She saw herself as a woman and I saw her, very attractive woman, small breasts, you know, the kind who could be a model. Yeah, yeah. You know, that That's kind of, kind of typical shape. with the case yeah. tend to be very... Um, statuesque maybe yeah so. and small breasts hardly any body hair attractive woman saw herself as a woman was able to have sex never really thought that there was something wrong that she was never menstruating <laughs> fell in love got married so we were faced so they had to remove the testes because undescended testes cause can be cancerous so the testes were removed Again, we are talking early 1980s. And the point I had to explain to the doctor, the, the gynecologist, how she was producing testosterone, but her tissues were unreceptive. So it's not really the metabolism, it's the tissue. The cells have things called receptors, and these receptors have to bind to the hormone testosterone and draw it in to, for it to be active. So that's why you talk of partial and complete androgen insensitivity, because complete is like this woman, where even possibly her brain was not responding. So because her brain was not responding throughout uterine development, and because there was no action of testosterone, even when she was the brain development, the what 
it seemed like she saw herself as a woman. But of course, she was socialized as a woman and her body looked like a woman. So, you know, there's this nature, nurture coming in there. Hmm. So the question is, what do you say? Do you tell her, tell the husband, well, you're actually married to a man? Or do you say, you know, you've got a problem, we've done the surgery, you're okay, you won't be able to have a baby, maybe you could consider adoption, but go ahead and live as husband and wife, which is what they decided to do. Which today may have been different, but this is early 1980s in Sri Lanka. Yeah. The, uh, what would happen after her uh, testicles are removed? Does she not still need the hormones? Did she go on hormone replacement? Yeah. Uh, and, she was given estrogens. Okay. And, but she could exist without estrogen. In general, we uh, need... Before the removal. Because she had testosterone, and if I'm throwing my mind back to my biology, there is a bit of conversion yeah. of testosterone to estrogen enough to keep her going. Because okay. with testosterone action is blocked, there is some metabolic conversion to estrogen, which is probably why she had the small breast. So there was there is enough. The body has, you know, as medics we call it homeostasis. Your body wants to reach a level of stasis or steady. Which is why, as you know, Benjamin, we have all these side effects of cross-sex hormones or puberty blockers, which is a really bad word for it, the gonadotropin releasing hormone analogs, which are called puberty blockers, hmm. because your body will fight it. Your hmm. body will fight foreign hormones because it is iatrogenic diseases that we are producing when we do that. Sorry, I get passionate about that. No, it, it, this is fascinating. So why does the body need the sex hormone? Why, why does my body need testosterone um, decreasingly over time, but, and your body needs estrogen? What, what is going on? Well, that's... I'm postmenopausal at 75, so I have estrogen, but very little at 75 years old. But the reality is that it's all about, okay, there's a gland in the brain called the pituitary hormone. We call it the master, you know, orchestrator of our body hormones. And it play, all our body hormones play a role at an appropriate age to maintain optimal health. So anything out of balance pushes us out of that optimal health. And our body tries to make up. But when it can't, then we go into some kind of endocrine hormonal problem, disease. So testosterone, little amounts from testosterone, estrogen from the uterus, there are levels of it and in the uterus, tiny peaks soon after birth, and then very low levels, the whole secondary sexual characters of puberty. And from there on, the kind of maintenance of fertility and sexual function is kind of driven by estrogen or test estrogen progesterone or testosterone. So it's that sexual and fertility drive. Now for women, when you reach menopause, it's like you've finished your suitcase full of eggs. And then, you know, you still continue to be sexual, but you know, because you don't have estrogen, your body parts kind of go, eh, maybe you shouldn't be having so much of sex. So like, the, the vaginal lining and, you know, even the brain libido. Men don't actually have a menopause. I sometimes people, especially in Sri Lanka, would say women have menopause, men have no pause. But uh, that's more the desire of it. But the, you do decrease in sperm quality yeah. and number. But mm -hmm. as you know, you can go on being fertile for a very much longer than women can. So it's that whole, you know, it's a life cycle. Mm -hmm. And during that time of sexual, you know, urge and fertility, we need those sex hormones. Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier about the difference between the ovum producing tissues and the sperm producing tissues. I've heard that the woman has all of her ovaries in the, in ova. uter ova in in uh, yeah ova all of her eggs are already built 
by the time she pops out of the womb. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Do, do, mm -hmm. Does the female produce any more ovum or ova? No. Well, yeah. you have them in like, think like just developing. You've got a full, I, when I used to teach reproductive physiology, I say it's like the baby's born with this suitcase full of ova, but they're like baby ova. And then it just sits there till you reach puberty. And then that's why you need your gonadotrophin releasing hormone, the DNA, you know, and that's what you're blocking because you need that to kickstart, to open your suitcase and start releasing one every month. So as you get older, you keep running out of eggs in your suitcase. And there comes a time when you finish those eggs in your suitcase and those eggs are also helping to produce your estrogen. So you're producing the eggs and producing the estrogen from your ovary. So as you finish your eggs, then your estrogen levels go down. So that's how we teach and that's simplistic way of putting it. Mm -hmm. So what process do the eggs go through to be ripe or ready for sperm? Are, are they each prepared one at a time each month? I, I kind of understand the yeah. menstrual yeah. cycle, That's but why we what talk happens about with the... the menstrual cycle? Okay. That as so when when an egg is released, which is kind of mid cycle, and then it's either fertilized or not, and if it is fertilized, it would get Im implanted in the lining of the uterus and become the baby, hopefully, or maybe not. But if it is not, and it's then the kind of the uterus goes, oh no, another month with no baby. And so it sheds its lining. And then at that point, when it's shedding its lining, the body then starts producing higher gonadotrophin releasing hormones and then what we call follicle stimulating hormone, which kind of explains what it does. It stimulates the next follicle in the ovary to produce the next egg. And so we go on till you reach menopause. And how are the eggs selected? Are they just lined up in a queue? <laughs> kind of. That's a simple way of putting it. Yeah, they kind of mature and sometimes too mature. So you might get twins. And one might mature and then get fertilized and split and get identical twins. So, you know, and there are some cycles where an egg kind of develops and doesn't get out there or, you know, something goes wrong. But generally, it's like one matures per month. There, uh, I think it's endometriosis, uh, which I don't want to butcher it, but I think it's the uterine lining just kind of growing all over the place, right? In the wrong spot. Yeah, yeah. in the wrong spot. So, because the uterine lining is a wonderful thing. I'm sorry, I'm a reproductive phys physiologist. I, I get it. excited about uterus linings and ova. It's like a garden. Not so much about sperms, but anyway. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> the thing is that the uterus lining, by the very fact that it every month from puberty to menopause, it keeps getting ready and then getting shed and then getting ready again. It's a very active site. Yeah. So because it's so active, bits of it can, and remember that, you know, you got your uterus the other way around. You, you're, you're in Australia, so you can do whichever way. <laughs> I'll just flip it over. <laughs> okay. So you got your uterus and then you got the two tubes and the tubes actually open out into your abdominal cavity. Okay, so there's a tube and the edge of the tube like that. So I'm the tube here and, and that's your ovary there. And so when an ovum is released, the tube has to kind of suck it up and then transport it to when it meets the sperm somewhere. <laughs> Sorry, that's kind of... And anyway, it meets the sperm somewhere there in the tube. But the point is because it's open over the ovary. So sometimes a little bit of that endometrial tissue, that endometrial or lining of the uterus tissue can get out. And that's one way into the lining, into your abdominal cavity of a woman. And so, because, I'm because sorry. it is being yeah. driven by hormones, it begins to also form that cycle and start going through 
you know, enlarging and bleeding, which is endometriosis. Okay. Um, so I, I'm sorry, I, I, I've watched videos on this, but it, it always just like, it's really hard for me to, to absorb the information, but the, so the, you got the, the ovary and then the, the fallopian and mm -hmm. what, what is it? it? It's just kind of floating. Like, like the, there's just this woman filled with water and, and there's intestines and kidneys and stuff. And, and then this little kind of weird floaty thing called the uterus, it's like, a, Fairly tightly packed okay. in the abdomen, and because it's like for you, like your, you know, you got your bladder and the prostate, and then you got the tubes coming out and going into. So yeah. and then your large intestine and bladder and everything sitting there. Yeah. It's fairly tightly packed, so it's like you know if you have a tissue box and mm. tissues inside them. All those tissues inside them are all your intestine, bladder. And for women, your uterus and your fallopian tubes, so they're all nicely packed in there. It's a miracle of creation, you know, like they're not just floating around. But there's enough kind of, I won't call it fluid, but lubricant to allow them to move around. Okay, yeah. Because your abdomen is like, I'm sorry, we're getting very anatomical here. This is great. The lining of the abdomen, the peritoneal lining, is always secreting enough lubricant fluid to keep things kind of nicely moving against each other. Mm -hmm. And that's important. Is so, it, and when things go out of place and maybe get twisted, yeah. then you get sick too. And does it ever, is it ever the case that the egg just kind of floats off up to the neck or something like that? Or doesn't get caught? Or does it is it ever the case that the sperm and the egg meet outside of that tube and problems happen or is there well ectopic pregnancy ectopic meaning not in the right place does happen occasionally and i have been at surgeries where the ectopic so we got the tube and the fallopian tube the end, end of the fallopian tube and it's fascinating if you watched videos there's an ovary and it's like the end of the fallopian tube will be like just like I love it, like caressing the ovary. Just <laughs> this is the part that just—I I don't know why, but it just kind of creeps me out. It's just like this little octopus inside. You. It's <laughs> beautiful. You know, instead of caressing, just yeah. waiting, yeah. waiting for yeah. that egg. It's so exciting. So it picks up the egg, and sometimes the sperm is supposed to meet it in the fallopian tube yeah. and then fertilize and then go back into the body of the uterus to get implanted because the fallopian tube is a tiny tube but sometimes it gets implanted in the tube and there's not much room for the baby to grow so then you have what we call an ectopic and it becomes emergency because it can rupture the tube mm. very rarely and i have never actually seen or heard this can happen where it gets fertilized and then actually gets out into the abdominal cavity and again it's an ectopic ectopic not in the right place so it can can't the baby, grow too yeah it can't grow it can't grow without that lining yeah yeah okay um and uh so uh one more question about the tube is there like a peristalsis or some some yeah. sort of like it, it's kind of yeah, like yeah. a it's shimmer, like uh, sucking it okay. sucks it up and then sends it okay and the sperms are so anxious, they can't wait. Yep. So they rush in and meet the ovum halfway. Yep. They're lovely things, you know, of sperms. Have you ever seen them under a microscope? Only in videos I've never seen. Oh, you should uh, have someone show you what yours look like. Okay. They're fascinating. <laughs> They're just going. They're just going. <laughs> They're just so, gorgeous, the way they run around. There's a... Um, this is totally anecdotal, but... I have done several interviews with detransitioners who probably have like the premier catalog at this time in history, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, just cause I keep on um, meeting them, but there's a, it seems to be the case that certain uh, women have endo uh, endometriosis and end up transitioning too. It seems like the, there's a, 
there, there's this odd um, correlation. I don't think it's a causation at all. And I'm wondering if there's a hormonal aspect to endometriosis or rather opening up the question if certain females relationship to testosterone would cause them to masculinize and then want to transition or even, uh, you know, become lesbian or, or affect the, the brain or the sexuality. Well, I have not come across the relationship between endometriosis and any form of like desire to transition. But the first thought that entered my mind when you said that is that puberty and the menstruation isn't exactly for most girls the most joyous time of their life. Now, Interestingly, let me tell you a little bit about a cultural context here. In our culture, when we were growing up, so I'm talking of teen years, 60s, early 60s, the, in, especially in our culture, that is Tamil culture, menstruation is celebrated as a rite of passage. So you sort of celebrate the fact that you have reached puberty and you're menstruating. What's the celebration because called? It's just a menstruation. So it's called, uh, what's it called? It's an adulting in Tamil. In the, hmm. uh, They would call it a, like coming out as a woman. Mm -hmm. There were underlying things there because it's also informing people that she's now ready for an arranged marriage. So there would, but to the girl, it would be have all these women come and spend time with her and they would bath her before the party. And there would be this big party and people would give gold coins, which really contributed to her dowry. So that was that was part of which kind of made puberty not so bad. But what I was trying to get back to is that puberty and the pain of menstruation is not very nice. Now you add endometriosis to that. It's horrific. It's horrific. I've had friends and patients who've been through endometriosis and it's very distressing. So I would just hypothesize that that would sort of mean, you know, it's awful to be a woman. Look what, what womanhood is. So why don't I just give up on this if there's a way of giving up? You see, we didn't have a way of giving up on being women. Mm -hmm. We just suck it up. So the reality is that maybe that being a woman gets just harder when you're in more pain every month. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Hypothesis. And why is endometriosis so much more painful? It's because that lining is happening all yeah. over the place? It's... Everywhere. In, okay. different, in the wrong place. You see, just the right place is uncomfortable in the uterus. When there is blood if in other places, which can't get out. I mean, if it's in the uterus, it gets out in the vagina. Now, if it's in the lining of your abdomen, it can't get out. And so it, it's just there and gets stuck there and causes pain. Mm -hmm. And is there an, uh, uh, this is a theory, uh, uh, maybe you could, maybe there's an answer to this question. Is there an adaptive reason for uh, PMS or, or menstrual uh, cramps and uh, extreme pain. It why would the body be built? Why would the human female and our other animals do other animals go through as intense discomfort so far as we know as the human female during menstruation? You probably have to ask somebody who studies animals for that the second part. Yeah. But part of you know, the pain of menstruation and the pain. Like, you know, as Christians, we would go back to say, look, in Genesis, when man and woman were created and man and woman were told to make babies and fill the earth, maybe they weren't meant to have menstrual cramps. But when we decided to tell God, look, you can go away, we are capable of looking after ourselves. There was what we say in Genesis chapter 3, what we would say, God said, look, not good enough. You're out of Eden. And part of that is that, man, you're going to struggle to work the earth and feed. And woman, you know what? 
having babies is going to be a painful thing. Maybe part of that is, guess what? Every month you're going to have the pain of knowing that you're producing this ova, this egg, which is a potential baby. So <laughs> that's just a theological maybe. But in reality, I don't think there's any kind of particular, you know, theory behind it. But, but there are for some women, it's also about how you deal with it. And if you are more able to deal with that reality of womanhood and the fact that this is part of being a woman. Like I would teach girls in Sri Lanka, especially, and even here, that, you know, wear your womanhood like a crown. Hmm. Because look, every time you are menstruating, even you're having your premenstrual cramps, it's something that tells you, you are precious as a woman, because you have the ability to create babies. And that's a wonderful gift. Hmm. And so wear it like a crown. Don't mourn it. So moving on to gender or masculinity and femininity, um, I was speaking with Susan and Marcus Evans just mm -hmm. yesterday, uh, who are psychoanalysts out in the UK who have yeah. done a lot of work with uh, gender identity. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, I just theorized in that conversation about the, um, that, our society went through a gender dysphoria before this huge uptick in gender dysphoria in our youth. The battle of the sexes, toxic masculinity, toxic femininity. Um, we've been at war. We've destabilized masculinity and femininity. It could be the case that uh, we, we try to liberate ourselves from these stereotypes and any sort of uh, codification on a cultural level of sexual reality that it's led to this crisis in gender. So I'm just wondering, and this is totally moving from uh, biology to culture, um, how would you perceive a healthy development of masculinity and femininity to proceed without the use of stereotypes or the imposition of stereotypes? Where do we start from? Yeah, where we start is like, this is how we teach. We teach, I mean, in Christian schools and, you know, this is how we teach and we teach in Sri Lanka as a culture. See, for one thing is that male and female are equal but with different roles. And so there is an equality, but difference. And therefore you love, you appreciate the equality and you celebrate the difference. So in that celebration of difference, but the appreciation of equality, you are able to care for each other in the difference. So let me just, tease that out into practical, the practical reality. So I am a woman and my husband and son are men. So as a woman, I'm happy to help with like so-called womanly things because partly it's culture because I was brought up to be the one who does the nurturing. So I'm happy to like, I love cooking and I love you know, doing fancy dishes for the boys. And the boys would see it as their role as accepting the fact that their celebration of being male, you know, the testosterone masculinity, is that they play the protection role. And it's okay for me as a female to accept that. I don't have to be, you know, equal, but I don't have to fight them on that. So there is that, that gentle acceptance. You see, biblically, we would talk about male being leader and the woman standing by the side and supporting. In Genesis, Adam, Eve, created to stand by his side as a suitable helper. That suitability means you don't have to fight that so-called glass ceiling but you have the role of caring and supporting each other. In your culture, is there um, like an invisible um, 
matriarchal power, like uh, stereotypically speaking, male would be the outer powers and female would be the inner power. And uh, it, it's, it's always kind of invisible. And whenever I get into an argument with a feminist and they bring up that no woman has ever been king and all the power has always been held by men, I kind of just suppose that all the power that was held and passed down by women is kind of secret, kind of stealthy, quiet. Is that in your culture too? And do you see any um, biological reason um, for the different kinds of power structures that we participate in as men and women? Well, again, that's not something I've done a lot of thinking about, but we as Sri Lankan, we probably globally, we were the first woman prime minister. Sirimavo Bandaranaika was a woman prime minister. Sirimavo, and that was when I was kind of later teens or early 20s. Oh, okay. And that was a long time ago. We are talking 60 years ago. Wow. Okay. So, you know, we were a country where w women were always celebrated. Like in my medical school batch, and we're talking 50 years ago, we had about 50% of girls to 50% of boys. And it's always fascinating. You know, the boys would tease us but they would always protect us. Hmm. And we would kind of, when we would bring something, you know, we would cook, we would share with the boys, and that would be okay because we were the girls, but they always had this protection of our girls. Hmm. And so there was a very interesting, they would tease us and we would accept the teasing, talking 50 years ago, but yeah. there was always women had a role and mothers, were precious because they were mothers mm -hmm. and nurturing the next generation was always, whether it Buddhist, Hindu or Christian or Islam, considered a very important, if not the most important role. After the man, what did he do? He brought the money home and produced the sperms. But the woman had to carry the baby yeah. and nurture the baby at the breast and basically had the most say in how the child grew up. Mm -hmm. And so women were always considered significant, even if not like a holy role. Mm -hmm. When we talk about the differences of men and women, sexually speaking, um, there's a greater predominance of paraphilias. Um, and I, I would like you to uh, define that term. Um, because I, my terms probably can't. Did, have you studied paraphilias? Was that a part of your education? Um, not a lot, but okay. enough when I was with Mickey in sexuality and working in the area. So paraphilias, the kind of definition would be a recurring sexual arousal, either fantasy, mental imagery, or behavior that would be something unusual or socially unacceptable. So we are talking things like sadism, pedophilia. And we would place, that's a paraphilia. Now, when it is a, the sexual gratification involves some, to an abnormal degree, some object, then we call it a fetish. Hmm. So a okay. fetish is kind of object driven. A paraphilia is more like, arousal, fantasy, or behavior driven. Okay. Okay. And men tend to develop them much more than women do. And women's sexuality is kind of tends to be more fluid from what I understand. How does that, how does that, what does that tell us about men and women? Um, and that, uh, you kind of brought two things there, male and female sexual arousal, and male and female, what we would consider orientation or sexual attraction. So park that one for a moment and talk about sexual arousal. Mm -hmm. In general, I mean, this is like from Rosemary Basson, we're talking back a long time, Rosemary Basson's work and Helen Fisher's work on sexual arousal patterns, mainly Rosemary Basson's work. It's like male and female sexual arousal patterns are different generalizing we can't say everybody but in general men are much more sexually easily aroused i when i speak i say hey they've got about five times as much testosterone as you women no wonder 
So the point is that they are much more visual, more sexually arousable, whereas women's sexual response is a lot more contextual. And this is why pornography picks it up. Men have more visual. So men would sit in front, generalizing, in front of a picture of a naked woman and be able to masturbate to it and get turned on. Whereas you talk to women, not many women can sit in front of a picture of an erect penis and masturbate to it and actually get a lot of excitement. So that's a difference between arousal of men and women. And probably that would lead to an increase in the kind of experimentation and paraphilias. Now, I can't quote research here, but it is likely. So that's parking that one. But when it comes to sexual orientation, I try to think of the researcher here who has done the work on that. But looking at the women being a lot more fluid in that they can be attracted. They, a lot of them would say they are bisexual, attracted to men and women, especially at teenage and early adulthood. And I talk to girls in high school. And part of it today is the confusion between good friendship. I say, Benjamin, when I speak to primary schoolers here, the primary school is about eight, nine-year-olds who would come to me and say, girls, I love my bestie. Bestie here is best friend. I love my bestie. I guess I'm a lesbian. It's like, hello, you're good friends. You know, we have lost the ability to celebrate same sex non-sexual intimacy mm -hmm. and we are trying to teach our young people that it's good to have friends you doesn't necessarily make you gay or lesbian and that's unfortunately what's happening with our young people and girls especially because they make good friends they move through this maybe i'm bisexual maybe i'm lesbian and so they said fluidity guys again because their sexuality is kind of more concrete, I think. And that's part of the research that can, men are much more likely to decide early or feel early that they're same sex or other sex or bisexual. Mm -hmm. I, I was contacted by a youth pastor a couple of weeks ago on Facebook, and he has been watching his youth group uh, start to bring in all this pronoun stuff and start to talk about gender and all this fluidity stuff. And he, he asked me, do you know anybody who could come to my youth group and kind of tell them about this in a way that would be enlightening and decrease the chaos? It seems uh, gender ideology is pretty chaotic. What would you say in that context to teenagers about gender ideology and all the meaning that is kind of spilling out um, of media right now on that? Yeah, we talk to, I mean, we talk to young people and churches. I just did one last week at one of our local churches. Two things, that gender ideology is one, obfuscating language, just confusing language, and two, conflating categories. So in language, we talk about the whole pronoun debacle, where, you know, there's the he, she, they, which is at least at that point, in some way tied in with biology, in terms of they maybe being non-binary. But then we got the whole, the rest of it, the Z and the they and the fe, which isn't even biological. And then you have object. I mean, I talk to people who kids call themselves a tree or, you know, you can be an object. So the complete loss of reality and anti-reality, really, when it comes to pronoun, kids get it when you explain it that way and sort of tell them that, you know, there's one thing about being courteous and respectful, but there's also buying into the anti-reality. But the use of the word, it's a lie, sometimes makes people draw back. But when you say it's an anti-reality, hmm. it's a kind of easier way for younger people to understand. So that one. 
Could you and expand on to, what is sorry. Uh, what it is about it that is anti-reality? Could you just tease that open a little bit? What is okay. anti-reality? Well, uh, what about? I tell them is reality is you are a male, you are a female, or there's 0 0.02 of disorders of sex development. So if we park the 0 0.02, and that is a very significant thing and we need to have a lot of compassion and care for people who are born with ambiguous genitalia. But in majority, we are male or female. So to say to call ourselves by a sort of pronoun that is not in keeping with our reality is anti-reality. Uh, it's just the way it's a lie. You can't and to buy in and I think Colin Wright has an excellent article on that, which I give our young people to read. And uh, because I believe that when I speak in Christian schools, the main thing I do is I give them a lot of literature that isn't coming from Christians, because they need to know that there's a lot of work out there in this area. Mm -hmm. So I get them to read Helen Trans and, you know, Lisa Littman and Abigail Schreier and all Colin Wright's work and mm -hmm. yours and everyone. So. And so the other thing I tell them, and I'll make this quick because you're obviously running short of time, I talk about the conflation of categories and we talk about biology. You know, it's determined at, at you know, the sperm and ovum meeting, at fertilization, it is determined and only confirmed visually at birth. There's nothing called assigned. So we talk about biology, then we talk about same sex, you know, sexual orientation. And as you are aware, all this push about, you know, it's about gender, not about biology. Like, when did that happen? You know, how can you talk about being attracted to a gender? It doesn't even exist. I mean, you know, a feeling. And then we talk about, you know, the whole thing of behavior. And as I talked to you about tomboys and effeminate boys and girls behaving, it's okay. Behavior is okay. And removing that stereotype. So those four categories and kids get it. So those are the two main things mm -hmm. we talk about. Mm -hmm. Language and the erasure of women. Girls really take on to that. So, you know, the language and the conflation of categories. So you, you mentioned a lot of books that you've written. You're doing a lot of talks, but what are what are these books? What is this series? You want to plug that? We call it Just By Chance. I have some of them here. <clears throat> Just By Chance, of course. We wrote one called Teen Sex by the Book. Hmm. It's, I'll just show it to you. That's called Teen Sex. The by the book means by the Bible. It's hmm. unashamed. And we have a whole chapter on gender, chapter on porn. And then we were asked, will you write something for puberty? So we wrote one called Growing Up by the Book. Hmm. And that's really uh, talks a lot about puberty. And we have pictures of like genitals and things, line drawings. And we have a lot about discuss with your parents. And then we were asked to write, unfortunately, I sold my last one called uh, for primary school. So we wrote, called, wrote one called Birds and Bees by the book, which has six books in it, little books. Um, me and my body, me and my brain, me and my family, and three extensions, you know, understanding sex, understanding pornography, and understanding gender at that primary school. Then we were asked, can you write something for parents? So we wrote one called Talking Sex by the Book. Oh, wow. Which is about for parents to, and now we have been asked to write one for preschool. And then people were saying, but what about us as husband and wife? So we wrote one called The Best Sex for Life, which basically says, Christians, you can have good sex because God created it. Hmm. And he wrote a whole, the Bible has a whole book called Song of Songs, which is full of good sex. <laughs> It's so spirited. <laughs> you have such great energy. Um, it's At difficult 75. with the. Um, it's difficult. Uh, there, the, the in America, we're, we're, again, like I said, we're always fighting over this stuff, and uh, these books appear in public libraries that depict sex, and they are um, embattled. 
about is this pornography, is this not pornography? It's very difficult to make uh, illustrations or uh, books about sex for children. It's just, it's really difficult. Um, how did you guys thread that? Oh, it was fascinating time because every time we published a book, my publisher is what we call the Anglican publication of Sydney. It's, uh, and it's it, Sydney Anglicans are probably the most conservative globally. So we, uh, every time I did one, it would go through all these ministers and archbishops looking at it. And we always had this joke that the archbishop and the ministers had never looked at so much of sex as when Patricia Wirakun was writing her books. <laughs> so we would have all these discussions whether, you know, the teen book should be talking about masturbation or should we be talking about anal sex? And I'm like, guys, this must be so much of fun in the Anglican circles now. What did you do before I started writing? So <laughs> we we would run it through a lot of cycles. And basically now people understand that this is not porn. We need to be teaching our children. And also, I mean, you mentioned porn, erotica for women. I mean, the books that are out there are pure. It, there's so much of erotica because, you know, women are contextual. So they want the books or, you know, the famous like, books that are out there, which I won't mention, which are pure erotica. So we Christians actually are writing books that are what we call faith inspired. Since you're talking books, I've got to show you my nonfiction. So this oh. is Empire's Children. It's a book that I wrote based on my, and that's actually where I grew up, the tea mm. plantation I grew up, and it's based on growing up and in the tea plantation and another book which we call snowy summer which is sri lanka as well as the snowy mountains in australia which is mm. our only claim to snow in winter so <laughs> so these and i'm just releasing my first of a trilogy called uh, serendib the white plague so that's coming out in December. So what we are doing is writing books about romance and sex and love, but without, you know, the dive for the pelvis and, you know, the second chapter being, you know, on the clitoris and uh, orgasm. Hmm. So we are drawing back and making it exciting to read and romance, but not erotica. We need okay. to have an alternate. Okay, so it um, it is not to stimulate arousal. It's to inform best practices in a uh, sexual relationship that's contextualized between them uh, and within and a re relationship. It's a novel. It's a novel, so it's fun. It contextualized in the stories of what's happening. Hmm. So, oh. Faith based. E but you don't, you don't call it erotica. What is it? Faith based. What? No, I call it faith. Faith-based romantic fiction. Okay, all right. It's, which oh, is not a euf euphemism for Fifty Shades of uh, Pontius uh, Pilate or something like that. I don't know. I didn't say that. <laughs> you didn't say I had to, I had to bring no, it up. No, I, I didn't up. say that. Hmm. I do have a rape scene in The Empire's Children, very mildly put, but that was the reality that yeah. the white planters would use the Indian indentured labor. Yeah. Like, their personal slaves. So I was portraying reality. Yeah. So that's what we do. We portray reality without it being erotica. Okay. And did you have a tiger on your tea plantation? Do you guys, what's the awesome cat on Sri Lanka? You guys have an awesome cat, don't you? We've but, got leopards. Leopards. Okay. Not, not Big panthers. Ones. Just like, oh, little, no. little leopards. Okay. Well, the tigers were what our terrorists were called. And that's another big story. Oh, okay. Tamil terrorists who are fighting for a native land, part of Sri Lanka, which is kind of crazy, given Sri Lanka is so small, but yeah. there was a lot of ethnic problems. And so yeah. they were called themselves Tamil tigers, but we don't have tigers. We have little leopards. Oh, I haven't okay. seen one, but they oh, used okay. to come in to the okay. plantation. Is there, any, what, is there anything you really miss about your home country? You wish you had an The tea? The tea. Good tea. Oh, okay. Yeah, because high country, high country single origin tea. Perfect. Mm. 
Mm. Uh, roasted or, or, or green? Oh, black tea. Black Plain tea. tea without sugar, no milk, just high country. Wonderful. Just like a really good wine. Excellent. Mm. Mm. Patricia, you, you said you're going to be boring. You bl blew my mind. This is great. It's a great con conversation. So I'll plug your, uh, I'll put your links in the description. Do you do any podcasts or is there any other social media that you do? If somebody wanted to contact you, where would they go? Uh, my website, it's really simple. Patricia Wirakun, one word, dot com. And I have a YouTube channel, which I call my COVID channel, which mm. I put together during COVID. That's linked from that website. What's the content and on your YouTube? What's um, everything other than gender, okay. because the gender is on closed YouTube, because yeah. mainly because I've done it in churches and I don't want the churches involved. Mm. So I put it on closed YouTube and I only send it to people who, okay. you know, honestly want to know. Mm -hmm. But uh, everything else like education, tips on good sex, talking to your kids, that kind of things on my YouTube. Mm. Wonderful. Wonderful. Such great time meeting you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. It's such a pleasure to meet with you and love your work. Thank you.